just unprompted. I don't know that I really have that much to say about Platonov, uh, to be honest with you. But why don't we try it now that someone's filming it? Uh, <laughs> you know, th thank you very much for the invitation. And um, I, I, you know, it's an, it's an honor. And, uh, and one of the things that, that I think is, is most interesting about this for me is that um, you know, I don't engage with books in an, um, in an academic setting. And I never really uh, did. And I never really gave myself the chance to because I was uh, too much of a prick. And it's true. And I, and I, was, I, and I was not very, um, uh, I, I didn't allow myself to be taught. Um, and I'm only kind of figuring that out now. And, and you know, where, that it, figuring out that it was a problem. But, uh, and then most of the time when I'm kind of dealing with things, then I'm, I'm dealing in a, in a critical context, which however much I can like flatter myself, it is a critical context, it's essentially like a commercial context where you know, I have to fill up some columns with some words, and then they pay me. And if I don't get it done by a certain date, then I'm fucked. And, uh, and it's the best ideas I can have in a certain amount of time. And then you have to start again with a whole other set of ideas. So this is, this is a nice um, sort of island of calm. I hope, I hope I can be calm during it. Um, right, no, but I just, you know, but, but I, guess, I, I guess I would begin with saying I never really deal with literature in a calm way. You know, I mean, that's part of it is, is relying on it foolishly, you know, or not to earn a living. Um, and, um, and so there, there sort of is no, um, the thought, if it's going to go deep, has to go fast um, and, and sort of never really hits at least a delusion of a bottom. But that said, um, I think that why I picked Platonov, so you're saying you know, something that had something to do with your work or was sort of foundational, which is a much better way to say what's your favorite book, right? And, um, and the reason why I picked Platonov is because um, is because I had uh, is because I had a crisis. It it had gotten actually to the point where I didn't necessarily understand what my relationship with language was. When I say a crisis with language, I want to be very concrete. My my crisis with language was, it felt like um, there was not a um, a common let's say valence. You want to use valence of rhetoric. There was not a common way of people way that people, that everyone was speaking to everyone on the page. And, um, and I think that, you know, this is a problem, I think, for all writers in all times. But I think it's a particularly acute one now when, especially in English, which is, you know, the great garbage dump of all languages, um, it just, just takes everything in. And, and in which you, you encounter people talking in, in many, many different ways with their own sets of reference. And beyond that, um, you know, uni universal access to a historical archive of ways in which to like, you know, communicate with other people, meaning we can look up instantly on the internet at any point in time the way people wrote sentences. Why a metaphor? Like, why do you write a metaphor, right? Because, um, because you come up with one and it's good? Okay, that's like one reason to write a metaphor. But like, what, what does a metaphor mean? Um, why do we like metaphors and how do they function? All of these very basic questions made me unable to write which, when you rely on it for your rent, means you eat rice for a long time. You know, I knew enough about the way literature was discussed that I understood that there are like, you know, there are principles of rhetoric. You know, there are things like synecdoche. There are things like, you know, metonymy, right? There are things like when you're writing something and you're constantly referring to someone <laughs> as, you know, the little bird walked across the square and, you know, went up to the large bear and begged from him, which is like a, like a Platonov type of sentence. And, you know, and, you know, in the metonymic structure of the book, of course, like the little bird is this little girl and the bear is the guy, you know, and, and then the question becomes how much do you kind of stretch out that metonymic structure um, to the entirety of the book, to the point where you begin encoding everything in a book. So I understood these basic principles that come from you know, classical, I'm not saying I understood classical rhetoric. I mean, I understand how it's usually discussed. 
that these are these functions of rhetoric that, that have these um, certain principles of efficiency, certain principles of persuasion. You know, uh, uh, the idea, I, I just spent a while covering the, uh, the Sanders campaign. And, you know, it's just very funny to be around everyone saying Wall Street, Wall Street, Wall Street, especially people who are not, you know, what, what is Wall Street? You know, I mean, like, it's, it's a million things. I mean, you know, pick, pick a number and it's that many things. Pick a number and then multiply it by itself and Wall Street is that many things, right? So these metonyms obviously begin shaping our minds and the way we think about things. And, but I still had this idea that, you know, if I came up with a metaphor, I came up with a simile, I came up with some sort of synecdical kind of thing, like this was all surface stuff and it was, and it, and it would be nice and it would kind of sound good. And then I spent my life not writing, walking around, you know, in this world uh, of fallen language where everyone's an asshole and wrong, which is, you know, everything that's said to you is a lie. You're surrounded by advertising language, by the hyperbolic, you know, a, a, no one is sort of even unconscious, you know, they, they're unconsciously betraying all of their most horrible atavistic instincts through everything they say because our language is degraded and not many people think about the words that come out of their mouth. They just osmotically assimilate them, right? And I never made the real connection that on one hand, there was this idea that there's this art world where something could be like this, right? Something could be metaphorically like something else. And then this other world where everything was a lie and, you know, like the thing that was presented as, you know, um, the American middle class was a delusion because the American middle class lives better than 99% of the rest of the world, right? So the idea that you, you could have these metonymic representations in a world that actually um, begins to structure your mind or your ideology. And it was kind, and it seems now that I'm saying it out loud, the dumbest possible thing. But for me, it was sort of a revelation that there was some connection between the way in which the world prevaricates and in the way in which I was trying to prevaricate on the page by saying, this thing is like this. This thing is like that. Right. And, um, and so on one hand, and I'll try to kind of condense this, but on one hand, I had this idea, okay, of, of again, of this writerly, how to make a nice surface or a surface that I liked. And then this world of surfaces where, you know, the references didn't correspond to the reference, right? It was all kind of, it, it was all like, you know, a false rhetoric. So in my mind, it's really Russian formalism that is the link between these very classical, these old ideas of rhetoric, of metaphor, of simile, of metonym, of synecdoche, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, how you live in the modern world where everything the government says is the opposite of the truth. And um, so, I just, so the one thing that kind of led me to Platonov, which I get to say, is, is Viktor Shklovsky. And I love Shklovsky, and I don't know if people care. I mean, you know, he's an interesting guy. Still read him. Still read him, good. So, you know, so this is probably like very boring to everyone, but this to me was the essential kind of thing, which is that, um, which is from his theory of prose. And I just, if we examine the general laws of perception, we see that as it becomes habitual, it also becomes automatic. So eventually all of our skills and experiences function unconsciously, automatically. If someone were to compare the sensation of holding a pen in his hand, or speaking a foreign tongue for the very first time, with the sensation of performing the same operation for the 10,000th time, then he would no doubt agree with us. It is this process of automatization that explains the laws of our prose speech with its fragmentary phrases and half-articulated words. It's this idea of living in a culture in which things are automatic, that, that you become kind of dulled to the immediacy of their life, right? That Russian formalism, I think, um, not only reinvents a lot of principles of just metaphor, just surface stuff, but actually, you know, I think saves the spirit of writing for a lot of the 20th century. Um, 
And I think Platonov is, is, the, is, is a great exemplar of this. Because I mean, if people, you know, reading Soul, this is a person who, you know, never sees anything automatically. And, you know, like talks to bushes and things. You know, like talks to, you know, thinks camels are alive and, um, and, and, and conscious. And, um, and recognizes one of the, like, just shittiest deserts in the world as, you know, a place of, of real um, habitants and, and, and life-affirming um, delusion, maybe, well, like, life affirmation. Um, but, so he had to go through a lot of, so then I started reading Platonov, out of Shklovsky. And have people read a lot of these not Platonov here? Some of it, no? So Platonov took this really weird turn where he was this like, you know, he was a railway engineer and he was, a, he was like a city guy. He was an aspirational city guy, because in Voronezh, like, you know, he's like, he's just at like a city level, but he, he wants to be like a, he wants to be sort of in the capital, but um, he writes all of these books that have to do with building the new Soviet society. And, you know, there are a lot of arguments that he is naive, because you get a lot of arguments that he is um, way too much of a true believer. There's other arguments that this guy was just sort of floating about a foot above the earth at all times, you know. But, but it's interesting to me that after he writes a lot of these city books that are all about the ways in which this new world is built in the city and new language is used, he goes out to the edge of, you know, the Soviet Union and, and hangs out with this tribe, which he, you know, which he did. Not John uh, specifically, but he went out there. Um, so something in this transition I kind of just want to point out, because I think it's really important for reading this book, Brodsky, who I think is the, the great writer on Platonov, has just, you know, I mean, Brodsky just kills it with the lines, but, you know, his great line about Platonov is, um, woe to the people into whose language Platonov can be translated. <laughs> woe to the people into whose language Platonov can be translated. You know, and which, and I, I think he meant it in every way that can be meant, but I really think that there's the sense of, the language that you use, the language that you use at a point in history when you still know better. <laughs> you know, in a sense, like, like, you can only really recognize and understand and laugh at that statement if you still know better, but recognize the estate as fallen. So, in just a little transition, I just picked up this little paragraph to kind of show the difference. It's the same translator, and we can get into platonic translation things, but that's just, will be here forever. Um, this is sort of the way it went from early Platonov where he was taking these fragments of Soviet speech, right, of like evil and dishonest Soviet speech and repurposing them and sort of neutralizing them. So this is, the, this is like a little paragraph of the early stuff. This is from a great book called The Foundation Pit. The Foundation Pit is a, a, a really a great plot. It can be, uh, they dig a big hole, it's entire book dig a big hole, and then they're going to build a big communal apartment building in the hole that's going to hold the whole world. Whole world's just going to live there. It's a plot. Engineers, this guy Prushevsky. Prushevsky took his head away from the planks and thought, far away a nighttime factory construction site was shining with electricity, but Prushevsky knew that there was nothing there except dead building material and tired, unthinking people. It was he who had thought up a single all-proletarian home in place of the old town, where to this day people lived by fencing themselves off into households. In a year's time, the entire local class of the proletariat would leave the petty proprietorial town and take possession for life of this monumental new home. And after 10 or 20 years, another engineer would construct a tower in the middle of the world, and for the laborers of the entire terrestrial globe would be settled there for a happy eternity. With regard to both art and expediency, Prushevsky could already foresee what kind of composition of static mechanics would be required in the center of the world. But he could not foresense the psychic structure of the people who would settle the shared home amid this plain. And still less could he imagine the inhabitants of the future tower, 
amid the universal earth. What kind of body would youth have then? What agitating force would set the heart beating and the mind thinking? So this is still at the point where he's, you know, repurposing like all of these strange slogans of, of, of the engineer's bureau and of like, what are the static mechanics of your soul? You know, and taking it seriously, and by taking it seriously, um, neutralizing it. But now you have soul, right, or John, and he's already at the point where he's completely fed up with this idea of being a parodist. He essentially goes through a postmodern phase of like taking official language and mangling it in like five years, and he's like, I'm done. And, you know, and then he does that, that crazy thing that it's just refreshing to remember that even Soviets did. Soviets knew better, you know? <laughs> you begin to idealize a simpler people at the edge of the world, and you go there to like get your spiritual education, right? Which I, you know, I mean, I'm not in a university nowadays. I feel like, you know, now there'd be protesters if you said you were visiting like a simpler people or whatever, you know? But like, he's doing this, you know? He's also like pretty much raping a child and, you know, he's doing a lot of things. But, uh, but he's going out there and doing this. And what's amazing to me about this book is there are all, you know, there are all of these, these Russian books about the guy from the capital who goes out to somewhere around the Caspian, you know, to, to present day Azerbaijan or to Turkmenistan or to Dagestan, you know, and sends a report back. I mean, you know, probably the greatest version of that is, is, is Mandelstam's Journey to Armenia, which is, you know, one of the great poetic diaries. But it's only, you know, Platonov that has this thing where his character is going to be a guy from there who's going to come to Moscow and, like, become civilized, whatever that means, and then is going to go back. And, um, and that, to me, um, I think historically, in a historical context, that's, a, that's a, a, an enormously brave and original choice, right? Because it was usually the, I'm the person who knows better from the capital who goes out. So besides being a brave and original choice for its time, I think it's a, it's a pretty brilliant choice and one that I've always really loved because um, you're not really sure in the beginning, in, at least in my reading, you're never really sure what are we talking about with point of view here because it's kind of always shifting. But in, at least in the beginning, you're getting the idea that a person you know, especially someone with a bias like, I'll just say mine, who, you know, I've been to Turkmenistan, it was a boring two weeks, you can't get a drink there and women can't drive, it, you know, nothing really happens. But like, uh, uh, the, it's like, you get this sense that maybe this is the way someone from there perceives the capital. So it seems like a kind of a slick move in the beginning because I read it as if, oh, this is kind of like close third, you know, to the protagonist. So that's why everything's being strangely described, right? As opposed to, um, you know, it being a, I mean, imagine if this was like a Maxim Gorky party being described in the beginning. It's just like, you know, then they set up the decorations, then they drank, then they went home. You know, like it, it, it won't have all of this. So I, I think that already for me is the, that set up in the beginning is already that set up that, that I think he's very, for me it's always a question, and I, and I know that this is academically like a, you know, a very large argument, but it's like, what is conscious? You know, what, what is a writer conscious of or not? And you know, that for me is the biggest question because I just, because I write and I hate being unconscious of anything, right? I, knowing that I will be unconscious of a lot, I try not to be. Um, and it seems to me that there's kind of some decisions that are made really early in the book that allow him to sort of stop making those sort of very writerly choices toward the middle and, and the book kind of achieves a different tone. What I mean by that is like, you know, like most of the time when you read a book that has realist elements, whatever, you know, 
and some magical or folkloric elements, it seems, at least to my mind, with the exception of maybe two or three writers I can think of, you know, probably the greatest being, besides Platonic, being like Marquez, right? That, um, that the material exists on two different planes, you know? Um, I mean, I always at least kind of feel that that transition between something that is real and something that slowly enters into a dreamscape or whatever word you want, um, y y you can see the writer sort of straining for an effect on both sides. But from the beginning, by insisting on this, by, by being resigned to this diction, by having this idea that maybe we're seeing it through the eyes of um, through the protagonist, he's already kind of telling you that you're going to have to um, constantly float in this middle ground between attributing the observations um, to the authorial third person, to authorial omniscience, and to, and to the protagonist. And I don't really know of that many books, frankly, that string you along in that middle ground for so long. I know a lot of books that do that free and direct thing of like, hey, look at me, I'm the author, I'm the third person omniscient guy, remember me? And then you're like in a character's head, you know, a character says something, then you're in their head for a little bit. Then you're in another character's head. I mean, I'm paragraphing here, I'm pressing return after each one, right? Then you're like, you're in another character's head. Then you're like in the other character's head. And then you're back into that paragraph of like third person omniscience, right? And you seem to always be toggling among these, among these consciousnesses. Whereas this really sustains this strange, I don't know, this, this kind of film over whatever's going on that allows the transition between types of material in a pretty elegant way. It's amazing to me to write a book in which you can make a section of a book operate where when someone talks exactly like they're supposed to talk, they seem like the weird guys. You know, that, that's a real triumph. And, and I think is, 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 is much more interesting, to be honest with you. So come along, and I think that the, the things that I, I want to begin talking about then are the, once he, he sort of sets up this realist thing where he, you actually finally find out why he's going there. You know, you don't find out why he's going there until he gets off the train. It's like, no idea. It's like, there is going, you're going, you're going next day, you know. Finally, after he leaves the train, abandons his luggage, sleeps outside, and then just walks four days, right? Then you find out in a kind of a realist section why he's there. And then that next large formal chunk begins to sort of explain to me what these moments of the interruptions of the real are, because you then get a scene that's framed as Zoroastrian, you know, theology, right? And you get this sort of strange floating diction. This is the paragraph, they went into the mud hut where Sufyan lives on a bed of rushes, which goes into the, um, the entire uh, um, Ormuzd expulsion the, sorry, the, the Araman versus Ormuzd expulsion. Araman is the devil who's not the devil. He's just the saddest guy who can't get into Iran, right? Can't get into Persia. Um, and it's done in this sort of knowing way. Like th this is the, you know, I'm giving you like a read on this myth or on this, on this religious tradition. But what, what's really interesting about this is that it absolutely neutralizes the idea that the rest of this book is going to be a folk tale. And I, I, it, it's hard for me to explain. I'm trying to explain this in like a way of like, if I were writing this book, I would be really afraid that this was going to turn into a folk tale, right? I, I was afraid that this would turn into something that was folkloric, that was, you know, in some way, um, I would have, why is folkloric bad? I mean, it would be, pathetic in a sense be, because I'm expending vast literary resources on people who are not literary, right? And, I'm, and, and I am trying to find in their head thoughts 
like you're trying to find food in the desert. It's pretty hard, right? And so one of the things you have to do is you have to do something to inoculate a reader against this notion of faux naivete, um, against preciousness, but also against just co-option of something and not like no literary originality. And so the idea that you would do something as blatant as giving the parable or the, like, like the structural metaphor that contains your book pretty near the top and just is like, yeah, I know this, you know this, take it. That's, that to me was, uh, is a great lesson and one that I've, I've, I've stolen a lot. This to me answers a really important question because just like I was having these metaphor problems, you know, it's like the, the symbol problem is, is even harder. Because why, like, why symbols, you know? Like, so we all can get good grades? It's like, seriously, it's just like, you know, like anyone who's gonna go out of their way to spend fucking $25 on a hardcover book and then spend hours of their day when they're much more entertaining and naked people around to watch and to think about, right? Anyone who's going to spend their time like actually like looking about something, camera, so like, are they really gonna be so happy when you're like, oh, look, a symbol. Oh, look, I noticed it, it's a symbol. You know, that's a penis, that's a vagina, that's money, that's this. You know, like, you know, like, what, what, like is it so Pavlovian that you get your little pellet of happiness when you recognize a symbol and you get petted? And it, like, is that it? it really, I mean, is, you know, is that all there is, right? And that's the problem. And I think that previously when people weren't as not only, you know, li like literate semiotically, but beyond that, when people maybe weren't as, you know, um, publicly in touch with certain um, emotions or drives, the idea of symbols would be a way to smuggle meaning into a work that it couldn't otherwise be there. You know, it's a way to kind of smuggle something in that would either be too prurient or in some way heretical or in some way prejudicial to the rest of the text. But now when there's nothing prurient, there's nothing heretical, who the fuck cares? The symbol to me is, what does it mean? But at the same time, I'm not willing to go all the way to the other side of the issue, which I think is actually even more morally bankrupt, which is to say that like, um, one can make a work either with no symbols or one can determine, you know, one can make new symbols, you know, in a sense, like as if, you know, not just inventing the fact that different things can represent different things, but actually saying that like there are new emotional states that can be represented. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going that far. What I, what I will say is that I think an answer around these questions of symbol, which are hideous and plague all of us in our lives outside of books, is to find a way to inoculate a reader against symbols early. Um, by doing something along the lines of what this does, which is telling the story, which is essentially a structural metaphor containing the book, you know, in, in miniature, a synecdoche of the book, let's say. And what I mean by that is like a gesture some hand to a reader that says, you know, listen, you know, I'm not an idiot. I know you're not an idiot. We like, I spent a lot of time doing this. You're gonna spend a lot of time looking at it. You know, um, we both know that things can be hidden somewhere that you can find and then feel good about yourself finding. But let's find a way to get rid of that notion of gratification, which I believe is kind of an academic approach to, to reading, if not honestly a behaviorist <laughs> approach, right? And say, um, once we clear that out and we acknowledge that we're living in the symbolic universe, maybe we can layer some things on top of this that bring us to some um, strange places and uncomfortable places and we can sort of figure out where that goes. What I mean is is that 
if you're living in a level of reality, whatever you want, consensus reality, right? Meaning realism in a book, right? You have symbols on top of it, and the symbols sort of operate on that world. Platonov is sort of saying, let's make the entire world a symbol, right? And then layer these weird realisms kind of coming into it, you know, at these weird angles to the point where you're really not going to know where, where you're at. And you're not really going to know, like, in a world of symbols, a tumbleweed is just a tumbleweed. Following a tumble, like, in a world that is a symbol, a desert that is a symbol, sometimes just, you know, a camel is a camel, you know? And, and, and so it actually makes for, in my mind, some pretty interesting ambiguities once he kind of lays out this entire... Um, this entire structural metaphor of this, you know, dualistic fight of the desert of darkness and this distant land of light and these people, this, this horrible demon who was kicked out, who might not have been horrible, might just be the saddest and poorest person, right? And then the next page being like, oh, or in the page after that, you know, the John, they're made up of a lot of criminals, a lot of women who run away from their husbands, a lot of dudes who deserted the army, you know, like, you know, not the bad guys, not the dark guys, but, you know, the sad guys, you know, like, just, and then just doing that and saying, right, like, here's my math. I showed you my work, but let's see, like, where it goes. That, I don't know, that, that to me is, is so much more interesting than, than all the mullions of the windows that look like crosses, you know? It's like, you know, the meeting with the mother is really weird, right? Because you get the idea that it's like this sexual thing. All of that bad Victorian novel stuff, British Victorian novel stuff, which then, you know, Platonov is definitely seeing in like Dostoevsky, right? Which is, fancy meeting you on the street. Let's exchange information. Or, I was crouching under your window and I overheard this. Or, I intercepted a letter. Check it out. You know, all of that. How does information get passed around in a novel? Um, can become really bothersome, at least to me, right? It just seems always, um, you know, see the strings. But the idea that, you know, he finds his mother is, um, is another thing that is completely, I think I accept it and don't feel that it's totally ridiculous because it comes so soon after I've just been directly told that I'm living in a symbolic kind of space. I mean, I, I was just, you know, to me, it's just, it's actually like a, it's a, you know, it's a funny thing to say in the desert, but it's a real estate question in the sense of like, you know, if you're going to show your hand, your metaphoric hand, where do you do it, right? Do you do it on the first page? Do you do it, you know, 20 pages in, you know, and, and the reason why that interests me is because if you kind of pull that trigger, that's where you're, that's where you're basically telling the reader, this is where we are forever, you know, like we're, we're in this world and like definitively in this world. And, um, and it just makes sense that it's done later than I would have guessed it would be and closer to that mother thing. I feel like there's this, you know, it's the classic thing of, you know, you begin your, you begin your, your, your first sentence should be the most implausible. So like people can just, because nobody really pays attention to the plausibility of the first sentence. So if you have something completely crazy to do, you just put in your first sentence and nobody notices and the second sentence just has to agree with it. And if you agree with it in the second sentence, then it's a fact, you know? And so just the idea of like where you put that metaphoric, where, where you unfold that, in, if it's in proximity, like some proximity to something that actually seems to be the most problematic within a mythic space, that to me is 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 a pretty is a pretty interesting is a pretty interesting decision. The interesting thing to me is when you bring in those elements of like the 19th century plot novel, because after that point, every time you do that, you threaten to puncture the dream. What I want to kind of show is 
how you get into the dream and how you get out of the dream. I mean, once you're in the dream, once, once you know, you're living starvation prose, you know, and you're sucking the moisture out of people's navels and tortoises look at you with the eyes of eternity and grin, right? And you can see the future corn in the water. You know, I mean, once you're in that, you're in it. And no, you know, no one's going to say you're not, right? But what's interesting to me is that how you get into it and how you get out of it. Because that seems crazy to do as a writer. It's like you want to write a fantasy in the desert? Do it. You know? You want to write a thing about a guy who descends into the heart of darkness? Do it. And then put a weird coda at the end, which is just, you know, not even about you, kind of, right? But it's like, oh, you want to really follow a person in, even though they're maybe from in, and then you want to keep them in for a while, and then you want to take them out again? And you want to do it all in this short amount of space, and you don't want to make the character change, right? That's, that's something. And so I guess the first thing you would, I would interrogate is, you know, why? And I think his why is, I think a lot of it is a conscious argument against exoticism. It's basically saying, look, you know, like, um, this is the world wherever we are. These are the rules of the world wherever we are. You know, we all want to, you know, it's like, the, in, the, like in the last line of the book, you know, you want to feel the soul coming from, so, only another person can bring that to you. Not your government, not your, you know, only <coughs> another person can bring you um, life. And, uh, and that, I think that's part of it. I think the other part of it is to deeply unsettle this idea of, you know, this book ends, I mean, is that polygamy at the end? Like, what, I mean, is it? It's like the guy's living with two women in the thing, and like, in Moscow, like that, and that's not legal then, you know? Like, you know, it's kind of interesting how that ends, right? It's sort of like, okay, maybe this is gonna be like a good Central Asian polygamous relationship in, in like downtown Moscow, at like at the, in the women's dorm of the Pete Engineers building. You know, so it's also kind of saying, you know, these things, you bring these things into your world, they, they come into your world. And this, and, 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 you know, drop these ideas of the normative, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's a reason why he wants to bring it in and bring it out. But I, I also think a reason why he wants to bring in and bring it out is because he wants to insist that, um, it's, and this is beyond the exhaustive point, though it's allied to it, that the world everywhere is this strange, right? And, um, but, so if, if I tried to sh show how we got into it by, again, like, you know, having these snippets that seem kind of realistic and then having it just laying out the metaphor right there, the alternation of those two types of material as if people in Moscow can hear his thoughts, which are backstory thoughts to Central Asia, he ends it sort of in the same way, but then it becomes very explicit. So the dog fell asleep um, beside uh, Chagataev. Idim continued to work on her own, walking two kilometers to collect water in his skin and kneading the clay with her bare feet. When Chagataev woke up, he found several people sitting in a circle around him. They had been waiting for him to awake. Sufyan, the eldest of them, told Chagataev that the nation had deliberately chosen to do without a soul. The nation had no idea of its own purpose was not tempted by better food, and it could warm itself with the weakest warmth of the heart, a warmth its heart drew from grass, from tortoises, from fish, and from a man's own bones when there was nothing for him to eat. Sufyan bent down Chagatayev's ear, pushing the dog away. The dog looked greedily and sadly at the people. Its dark, difficult hope lay in a desire to eat all these people when they died. The dog had not come to Sire Kamish by a shortcut of its own, but had taken the same path as the nation, Keeping a long way behind, it had eaten the people who fell in the desert, and during the day it had buried itself deep in the sand so as not to be seen by steppe eagles or other predators. Sufyan said to Chagatayev, oh, by the way, in the Russian, other predators is like basically like kulaks. Sufyan said to Chagatayev, you've got it wrong. 
It's not that the nation can't live. It's that it isn't allowed to. When people start wanting plov to drink wine, to possess robes and tents, strangers will appear and say, here, take what you want. Wine, rice, a camel, the happiness of your life. No one will give you that, Chagatayev interrupted. They used to give us a little, said Sufyan, a handful of rice, some flatbreads, an old robe, the Bakshi's uh, evening song. We used to have all those things long ago when we worked on the base irrigation canals. When I was small, said Chagatayev, my mother sent me away to find food for myself. We had very little. We were dying. Very little, Sufyan repeated. But we always wanted a lot, sheep, a wife, water from the irrigation canal. There is always an empty place in the soul where a man wants to tuck his happiness away. And so for that poor, infrequent morsel of food, we worked until our bones dried up inside us. It was the soul that died first, said Chagatayev. Yes, first the heart would stop feeling. A tumbleweed bush is freer and more alive than a laborer with no land. Sufyan did not agree. The soul doesn't die, he said. She becomes a stranger. She thinks bad is good. She gets bored inside us. She imagines what doesn't exist and promises what never will exist. You must have been given someone else's soul, said Chagatayev. We've never known any other soul, Sufyan replied. And let me ask you this. If we had to work ourselves almost to death just for a little food, then how can even death itself be enough to earn us happiness? Chagatayev got to his feet. Life, enough, life itself is enough to earn you happiness. Our soul is in the world now, and that's the only soul there is. I've heard all that, Sufyan began with indifference. We know there aren't any rich any longer, that they've all died. But you listen to me. Here Sufyan stroked Chagatayev's old Moscow shoe. Your nation is afraid of life. It has lost the habit of life, and it doesn't believe in life. It pretends to be dead. Otherwise, those who are happy and strong will come to torment it again. The John have kept almost nothing for themselves, only what nobody else needs, so that nobody becomes greedy when they see them. So I mean, that to me, to my mind, is not only like the key passage, really, politically, in the, in the book, but also the key transition between that dream material, if we're saying in the middle, and back to Moscow. It, it, it's, it, it's a solution, essentially, to, it does a number of things. It, how do you write a non-intellectual character? How do you write, you know, at this point in, in time, it's like, how the fuck do you write a character who's not a writer, you know? It's like, right, it's like, it, it, and, and the answer is you choose your moments. Sufyan can't talk about that all the time, but anyone can become whatever they need to be at the moment they need to be that. And, you know, because everybody has their speech, let's say, in life. And this is sort of, this is Sufyan's, and it's there. And it pushes so directly against um, this world that Chagatayev's going back to um, in this way that, um, in my mind, recasts a lot of the other sort of refusals to speak earlier in the book. Look, I, I think it does a lot of things. The mechanics level of the book it's in order to speak this way. It's in order to give a person who previously didn't have this access to this type of speech, this type of speech. But it's also this, um, also making this point that you need to do all of this spade work for, which is, you know, you can't actually get to this point where you say something like, um, you know, the soul becomes a stranger. She thinks bad is good. She gets bored inside us. She imagines what doesn't exist and promises what never will exist. Like, like to have that resonance and to have that resonance be, well, is that the promise of communism? Is that the promise of capitalism? Like, what pro is that every promise ever made? You know, uh, is, 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 that the, is, is that the promise of language? That language, it's just because it's promised, it's spoken, that like what I was trying to talk about earlier in the class, that, that, that everything I'm saying corresponds to a real meaning and isn't just some metonymical, you know, rhetorical device that's floating and means nothing, you know? So the idea that, that he's sort of calling it at that point, this can only happen this late in the book. And it can only really be the last thing that you're going to really hear from Sufyan, like in, in that way, you know? Um, yeah, and, and I think there's so many lessons to learn from that from a very technical level of like, 
you can make anyone with any mind say anything at the right moment. Two, it's not about what people say, but when people say it in terms of the way dialogue casts things previously. You know? Um, dialogue is almost always seen in books as setting up what's next because it's really easy. It's a really quick way to do it. You know, in other words, like, you know, the classic thing, if you set a scene, you put everyone together in the scene, and then people are talking, and it's like, did you hear about this? Did you hear about this? Did you hear about this? Did you hear about this, right? And, and, that, and even if dialogue seems to be summing up events that are previous, it still are hinges, usually in books, to what's next. Now, partially that's because we don't write philosophical novels anymore, where people have long discussions like this. But this is a tiny discussion the size of a dialogue exchange in a contemporary novel, which is pretty short these days, you know? And, um, but it has all of this resonance kind of looking backwards. Um, and and that's, that to me is, 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 pretty, is pretty notable. Um, it's, it's these sections here of like, as straight as this gets realism, it's all the section in the Chiva Bazaar, which for me is 127, which is, uh, which is, it's like chapter, it's like in the middle of chapter 17. It's a very long paragraph that begins, Chagatayev appeared in the Chiva Bazaar about noon. For me it's like 127, 124. You have here in the Kiva Bazaar about noon, the sun already on its way towards summer cast a clear light over the littered square, and the ground was growing warm in its heat. Round the edge of the bazaar stood the house of the people who lived there, and near their blind clay walls set the traders, where spread out over the ground. Desert goods were also being traded from low wooden tables in the middle of the square. Here lay small stacks of dried melons and apricots, uncured sheepskins, and dark carpets, woven in long solitude by the hands of women and representing the entirety of man's fate in the form of a sad, repeating pattern. You want to skip down a little bit, because I want to read all of it with my voice, but you skip down to your lines, you see the sense. And so they went on trading, exchanging one item for another, without profit and without loss. Life, in any case, slipped by, forgetting itself among the distinctions of crowds of the bazaar, and the old men were content. Then you go farther down. Beside a box of rubbish, leaning against it, stood a young Turkmen woman. She was pressing her veil to her mouth and looking into the distance over the heads of the people in the bazaar. Shagatayev looked that way too. On the edge of the desert, low over the ground, you could see a line of white clouds, or perhaps with the snowy peaks of the Kopet Dag and the Parpamiz, or maybe it was nothing at all, a play of light in the air, the illusory imagination of a distant world. What was the soul of this girl thinking about now? Had there not been people living before her, older people who should have thought through everything tormenting and mysterious, so that this girl could be born into a happiness already prepared? Why had people before her lived, if she, this unknown Turkmen girl, was now standing perplexed before her thoughts and sorrow? So, the reason why I'm kind of pointing at these things is because while a lot of the rhetoric is the stuff from before, it's like these are doing very, very kind of classic novelistic things of, you know, obliquely illustrating themes, right? You have this trading economy, right, where everyone is sort of, it's a description of a marketplace, of a bazaar. But then after a description of this bazaar, where you actually have recognizable reality of just, this is a good, this is a certain, you know, this is good, this is good, this is a good, like apricots, melons, this, people are walking, you know, people aren't crawling and talking to eagles, you know, like we're in a bazaar. Then there's this kind of notion of, but it, it just circles itself forever and everything just kind of continues, you know, and, and, and you don't profit, you don't lose. So you get this idea that it's like a political allegory too, but it, it fulfills this realist function of bringing you back into the world. And then the, the next section does the ultimate thing like that, which is giving the Turkmeni girl who along with the Uzbek Hiro has the nail, is a, a stand-in or like another version of Chagatayev when he's young being sent by his mother out into the world alone and him having to be told to avoid the Chiva marketplace but don't look for your father but go out there kind of into the world lost and at, right after where I read there's a whole thing about how unhappy your parents and all their tribe must feel, right? And so that classic, these classic things of like doubling the fate of a, a protagonist or like the thing that happens to the protagonist in their youth should happen to another youth later on. You know, like um, th these ideas of like, you know, 
economy and, and, and circularity that are all in dialogue should be shown in the form of a material image, the bazaar. Like, I guess like, all right, I'll put it this way. If I was doing this, and I was, and I was doing it with a gun to my head, right? Like, 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 do, like write this thing now, right? I would say, okay, I'm in a marketplace. I'm going to bring back this idea of me as a child, and I'm going to assign, I'm going to sort of project my childhood feelings on. I, I, and because I'm a, sh I'm a shittier writer, I would not, I would have said, okay, pick one. The Uzbek kid or the Turkmen girl? <coughs> like, serious, you know, like, you're going to project who you were as a kid or what happened to you in one paragraph, uh, pick one person. You know, like, of course you pick one. Why would you pick two people? Like, it just seems, it, it, it would just, it would, that would seem to me to be the excessive decision. But the fact that it's like, he's like, look at the kid with the bent nail, and then he kind of gets bored of him and he looks at the girl. Like, there's just something in it, and again, I might be reading into it, like, that kind of feels that, like, it makes it feel like Chagatayev, who doesn't have a ton of interiority in that way, is actually l actively looking for his younger self. Like, like, oh, maybe that one. Maybe that was me. Nah, maybe that one. Maybe that was me, you know? And then where does he end up? He ends up with Adim, you know? So it's, it just, it, it's an interesting decision. And like, he might have been, he was never a bad writer. He might have been worse at times and sloppy at times. But I think to make the decision of two is very conscious. And to go uh, uh, boy, girl, and then girl, he's basically abducting. How old is she, by the way? Like 14. I mean, which in his defense is middle age, or like at that time. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, that's really why, of all the difficult Russian writers, Platonov is the one that, like, now is really read by people who don't read literary books in weird ways, you know? Like I, a friend of mine was doing this, this, this whole like, you know, prison, Russian prison documentary thing and, and he was just, you know, and I just like, thought he was like telling like, make me happy. But what it was like, you know, it's like, there are Platonov books. I mean, there's a ton of porn and a lot of other things they like reading, but like Platonov was there sort of uniquely among people, let's say in the early part of the 20th century, or like of 20th century writers, you know? And one reason is, is because it really has this um, words from work and words from, um, and a doubting of like the verbal, of verbal capacities that I think um, is not done in any way that condescends to a reader, but that actually like, makes a reader want to read. Like, I can't think of a book that has more people in it who aren't literate that is more anywhere near as interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.